So my name is Veli Matti Kerkeinen, and as I mentioned, um, uh, often my students call me Dr. K because uh, it's a long and complicated uh, European name. I have been professor of systematic theology at Fuller Theological Seminary since 2000, so for the past 14, uh, 13 and a half years. And I also continue my uh, appointment at the University of Helsinki, where I teach uh, ecumenics. Um, my, uh, the, the first volume of my five-volume series, uh, Constructive Christian Theology for the Pluralistic World, the first volume, Christ and Reconciliation, was published um, in May this year, and uh, second one, Trinity and uh, Revelation, will come out in April uh, next year. So the, the volume is, the, the, the five-volume series is already started. And why do you feel it's necessary to reconceive theology for a pluralistic world? It's been in my mind uh, for some time, many years, to try to, to reconceive or reimagine the whole idea and task and nature of theology in, in the kind of world where we live. I mean, when I talk about pluralistic world, I mean uh, religiously pluralistic, um, philosophically, culturally, and um, I think in order for the Christian theology to speak to today's issues, we have to do what our church fathers, what our reformers and others did, namely, they took the old tradition, ancient tradition, and they spoke to the issues of today. It's just the fact that our issues are different from, say, Reformation. So in one sense, I don't consider myself doing anything new and novel, I'm just doing what my forebears have done, but in a new context. Hmm. Um, so you begin with Christ and reconciliation. Yes. Yeah, and thanks for asking that because, um, or sometimes um, I am asked by my students, why did I begin with Christ and reconciliation? And I say, in one sense, I don't know, because um, this five-volume series, um, it is not a traditional summa theologia in which uh, you have to begin from point A and end up in point uh, Z or whatever. It is rather an idea of um, having multi-volume work in which I have space and time to talk about all the important topics, where to begin and where to end is a secondary and almost a non-issue. Um, ironically, I began with uh, Christology and uh, Reconciliation because although I had written a textbook on Christology, I have never done um, very much work in the area of Christology and Reconciliation, so I wanted to have an opportunity to uh, have a new kind of fresh experience. But as I said, I could have started from somewhere else. Hmm. And also because the, the five volumes they, although they form a kind of um, entity or series, they can be read um, in their own rights. So each of the volumes can stand on its own feet. And that uh, also adds to the fact that um, where to begin is not important. Uh, what distinguishes that volume from other volumes about Christ and Reconciliation? Um, each volume um, distinguishes itself uh, in terms of um, what are the specific uh, dialogue partners or the kinds of materials um, that I engage more deeply. Uh, let me explain. First of all, all volumes follow the same uh, general template, namely I'm going to engage um, the, the wide and deep long Christian tradition and also the global diversity of uh, Christian theologies, plus four living faiths, um, Islam, Judaism, um, um, Buddhism, and um, Hinduism. And uh, depending on the topic, I also deal with um, natural and behavioral sciences. But in, in Christology, uh, because of its nature, I um, deal extensively with uh, contemporary New Testament studies for the obvious reasons. 
in um, volume two, which is on Trinity and Revelation, um, I have a fairly extensive um, engagement with philosophy because uh, questions such as the existence of God and the possibility of revelation, they are embedded deeply in philosophical traditions. Whereas um, uh, volume three, which I already finished the manuscript uh, in July, uh, it's on creation and uh, theological anthropology. I have a very deep engagement with natural sciences like um, cosmology, quantum physics, um, and then on the human side, evolutionary biology, paleoanthropology, and such, and philosophy of mind. Because to talk about the nature of human nature, you have to talk about issues that are dealt with in philosophy of mind. But, uh, but on the other hand, also, like in creation and humanity, um, I go deeply into the um, kind of myths of origins in other religions, like uh, they don't have creation theologies like Hinduism or Buddhism, but they have a um, wide scriptural tradition of talking about the origins and such. Or when it comes to theological anthropology, when I talk uh, either the image of God or sin and fall, I also deal with such issues in other religions, but also in sciences. So, um, even though I have this general template to follow, each of the volumes um, has their own distinctive feature. I'm currently writing volume four, which is uh, on pneumatology and salvation. And in pneumatology, I have to I go more widely with the cultural diversity, like how. African, Asian, Latin American cultures are conceiving spirituality and those kinds of things. But again, not ignoring uh, Christian tradition and the four living faiths. So it's a kind of, I'm also developing the method as I am going about my work, but yet in the beginning I already, like the, the very long introduction to Christ and Reconciliation gives a general methodological orientation. I'm uh, personally fascinated with the interaction of Revelation and the Trinity, mm -hmm. uh, and I th am particularly interested in how you relate this very Christian notion to a pluralistic world. Yes. And I was just wondering how you would go about that. Yeah. A couple of um, things. First of all, um, I'm very happy to talk about Trinity and Revelation because it's fresh in my mind. Mm -hmm. I just um, um, responded to the Erdman's editor's um, latest questions. It's now going to the proof reading. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about revelation in a pluralistic world, on the one hand we need to take into consideration the, the deep and wide um, kind of uh, Western philosophical and cultural diversity where beginning from the Enlightenment and uh, since um, when basically in, in post-enlightenment world, the whole idea of the possibility of revelation has been questioned. That's one. But more importantly, um, I deal extensively with how, what is the idea of revelation and scripture, for example, in Buddhism and Hinduism. To do so, I have to introduce to the Christian reader the, the wide canons of, say, Buddhist and uh, Hindu scriptures and um, against uh, many suspicions and uh, kind of common sense assumptions, I try to show that, for example, in Hinduism, there is a very deep authoritarian understanding of revelation, meaning that Vedic uh, scriptures are considered to be divinely inspired. And even Buddhism, which is uh, somewhat non-theistic, um, the scriptures are considered uh, extremely authoritative, let alone in Abrahamic faith. So what I'm trying to remind my, my Christian uh, theological colleagues is that even though in Christian theology as a result of Western post-enlightenment world, the idea of kind of authoritarian or say divinely inspired revelation has come under uh, much critique, in all faith traditions, even the non-theistic uh, Theravada, there is a very deep belief in the divinely inspired revelation. Mm. 
And so we have to Nico. So now you can see how different uh, location or how in a very different location I locate the Christian theological talk about revelation when it is put in the midst and uh, the matrix of the religious the pluralistic world. I don't think that my um, theological colleagues who otherwise don't believe in divine authority would be um, persuaded, but at least um, we have to reconsider the possibility of reconceiving the doctrine of revelation. And also what I try in that um, volume, which is somewhat counterintuitive, is that I argue that a Christian revelation uh, in relation to what used to be called like natural revelation or general revelation. First of all, I'm saying that we have to blur the distinction between special and general revelation. And therefore, I consider natural theology one form of Christian Trinitarian theology. So I have to be very critical of uh, Karl Barth and others who understandably but mistakenly um, opposed to natural theology and general revelation. So I'm basically, so one long chapter is uh, titled something like um, Natural Theology as a Christian Trinitarian Theology, which uh, of course blurs the distinction between the two. There's still a distinction to be made, but not any, anything like the separation what uh, tradition did. But when I do so, I go back to Thomas Aquinas and some church fathers and um, kind of negotiate again the whole possibility. Which brings the, us to classical panentheism. Yes. Could you <laughs> find the, that for us? <laughs> In the Doctrine of Trinity, um, I think um, one of my um, more distinctive uh, humble contributions is the, the notion of classical panentheism. Uh, again, I, st I first um, look very carefully at what's wrong with classical theism. And, and I think there are many things wrong about classical theism, but against um, or differently from many of my contemporary colleagues, um, I also think that um, we have to appreciate again many of the valuable things about classical theism. They just have to be reconceived. And then I take a very careful and wide look at uh, forms of um, panentheisms, say from moderate ones, say Moltmann and some f uh, feminist um, theologians, all the way to process theism, which is an extreme form of panentheism. And I also look at, at how many science religion advocates, uh, say Arthur Peacock and others, um, and Philip uh, Clayton and others, um, are drawn into panentheism, and I myself am, but uh, I am not uh, drawn to the kind of panentheism which uh, is the mainline panentheism nowadays, namely which uh, juxtaposes itself to classical theism. Um, I want to have the uh, the cake and eat it in a sense. If it, so, so I, and therefore I'm talking about classical panentheism where. Uh, I am a sort of panentheist, but in a way that is also critical of some of the contemporary forms, and, and I try to have the best of the two worlds. So I think that um, my conservative uh, critics would um, think that I am way too you know, modernist <laughs> or too uh, progressive, and then the progressive ones look at me and say I'm still too classical theist. And I think that's a good place to be, because then I also relate it to four other living faiths, and especially to very carefully to other um, Abrahamic faiths, Islam in this case, uh, and and I show how, what are the implications of classical panentheism to to interfaith dialogue, but also to science religion dialogue. Do you uh, do much conversation with Hegel? I do some, uh, and that's the reason. Uh, the, the reason is that um, the two most important, or not two most important, but a, some of the more important dialogue partners for me are Pannenberg and Moltmann. And of course, in Pannenberg's uh, theology, there is a Hegelian undergirding, or he's not Hegelian, but uh, Hegel, 
he has a clean from Hegel and so therefore I also um, go back to that's one of the reasons why I go back to Hegel and any notion of um, God world relationship um, owes something to to Hegelian uh, view even though I also find it um, problematic in the sense that for Hegel any talk about the spirit and an absolute spirit um, it's so non-personalistic yeah. true. Which is, I mean, it would uh, take us a long time to, to go back uh, into Hegelian critique. <laughs> and I also talk about Hegel when I deal with, um, with um, contemporary forms of atheisms. Mm. Because um, I, have, I develop uh, uh, a kind of taxonomy or typology of forms of atheisms from, uh, say, the 19th century, Feuerbach, um, Marx and others, all the way to what I call contemporary religious atheists, who are atheists, but not atheists in the classical sense. So, where would you put Zizek? Just out of curiosity, <laughs> I I would put him in the middle uh, middle group uh, where he is uh, neither a typical um, old time atheist, but nor a uh, neither religious atheist, but there's are two. Uh, it's, it's fairly, um, we don't have uh, the time to go into details, but there's a typology of uh, atheism. Of course, I also deal with uh, real atheists such as uh, Dawkins and others, right. but I don't find them interesting because they are philosophically illiterate and it's embarrassing to read their texts. That's exactly why I yeah, yeah, about yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Here's my selfish question. Uh, a frequent conversation partner for you is Kevin Van Hoosier. Mm -hmm and of course von Balthasar. Yes. <laughs> uh, what has, how has, have they separately and together influenced your theology? Yeah, it's interesting um, even though I have known Kevin for many years, um, I came to to engage uh, some of uh, von Balthasar's ideas much much earlier in my student days at the University of Helsinki um, and that was because I was studying ecumenics and uh, we also had to make sure that we get uh, a good dose of Catholic theology. And I was first um, made to study Rahner, whom I know best, um, but then uh, Rahner, and from there I went to De Lupac and, and von Balthasar. And of course, in Balthasar there are many things, uh, not only his aesthetics, but kind of appeal to me. And so it was uh, an interesting thing that when I uh, uh, moved to teach here, and I came to know Kevin also, Van Husser also in person, and with great uh, interest I started reading his writings and certainly the drama of doctrine. Um, I was so pleased uh, to see that he is gleaning, as an evangelical, he's gleaning from various sources that evangelicals have not often engaged. So from, if I go uh, more precisely to, to Van Husser, um, I really, um, like uh, Kevin's idea of uh, of trying to speak of theology in a more as aesthetical way or aesthetics and a kind of um, more holistic way and the way he negotiates uh, the widely um, debated question of foundationalism. Even though I have to say as a European theologian that it's interesting that foundationalism is uh, limited to Anglo-American philosophy. When I go back to to Europe, where we and I, of course, uh, because I also studied philosophy, um, I have come to to know Anglo-American philosophy later in my life. We studied uh, continental things, and and so and uh, so coming to Anglo-American philosophy from the continental side, you encounter debates that we didn't have there, and yet I think here they are important. But the way Kevin um, negotiates. Um, uh, similar to myself, uh, he is a sort of post-foundationalist, um, which can mean more than one thing. But so there, there are common features um, in, in with uh, Kevin's uh, project and mine. And I also look forward to when he is going to do more writing in systematic theology and not only in prolegomena. Uh, who are you seeing as your main audience for this work? Um, uh, uh, I try to be somewhat humble, but if I'm not, um, 
I consider as my audience the whole uh, global theological academia because even though I write from a perspective, uh, I'm a, an aging white European theologian uh, with wide global experience, um, but having been trained as an ecumenist, I feel very comfortable in writing for and gleaning from the wide variety of, of Christian traditions. So I, I imagine that both uh, on the Protestant and uh, Catholic side, both what used to be called conservative and liberal, um, my project um, will be at least noted uh, or, or maybe looked at. And, that, and also beyond uh, Global North uh, in, in the Global South. So I, this is, is a wide audience in a pluralistic world that I target at. And in my brighter days, I also imagine if, for example, a Muslim scholar or a Jewish scholar who knows enough of Christian theology would uh, pick it up and, and look at what I'm writing from the, say, Muslim Christian perspective maybe even beyond. Mm. So I have cast my net widely, or in a very wide uh, sea. Wonderful. Um, and what would you hope the impact would be? I, I hope to be able to renew and redirect uh, the course of Christian theology in the global and ecumenical sense. So whatever um, my reviewers think of my project, and, and I'm more aware of its limitations than anybody else, but whatever is the reception, I think that theology will not be the same once the, volume, once the five volumes are there, because at least I think I'm raising the, the correct uh, questions, and people more brilliant than myself may come up with better volumes, but I think we are in the turning point uh, in the way constructive Christian theology is being done. <laughs>